Hello and welcome to the Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. Today I am recording my podcast here in my hermitage. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the hermit life and I thought how perfect to record this here where I lived it for years and years. Um, it's my little oratory in the woods behind my parents' house and it's a little 10 by six foot shed that we built with a life-size crucifix of my sweet Jesus. And um, I would come here and pray for hours and hours and hours. I spent many years um, praying in here. So it was a little tricky to do because the light is not great. Um, but my dad found me a spotlight and I hope that this works <laughs> so that it'll record properly. So let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Sweet Jesus, we praise and adore and glorify you for your great love. And I ask you to extend your arm spiritually around me the same way that you are physically behind me right here. I ask you to enwrap me in your love, to keep me under that shadow of your love. And I ask you to encircle the hearts of all of those you bring to listen to this and to seep your love into them. Please do not let my work be for naught. Empty me and make me an instrument to bring many, many souls to you. We call on you and we love you and we praise you. And we ask your mother who always abided in your love to stay with us and to pray with us and all the angels that live here to intercede for us in this next hour. Amen.
Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. How can we not have an awesome podcast if we just pray the name of Jesus, who is everything? <laughs> he is so awesome. So today I want to talk about the hermit life, but I want to talk about it from the perspective, the Russian perspective. Um, because there's hermits that people can be familiar with um, that are canonical and sometimes are attached to a religious community and are very Western. Um, but the hermit life that really resonates in my heart and soul is the Eastern spirituality of hermit, of eremitical life. And the years I spent as a hermit, I, I read piles and piles of books of Russian hermits and Greek hermits and, you know, the, the Egyptian hermits. Like the hermits that were from old in the East and the way that they lived this life from the very beginning, right? Because the way Anthony of Egypt, you know, or um, Paul of Thebes or you know, Mary of Egypt, some of these, you know, first hermits in the church, Mary Magdalene, you know, after Jesus rose from the dead, withdrew to France as a hermit. The way that they lived it um, looks very different than if you were to find a Benedictine, you know, hermit community in Nebraska, which I don't know if there are. I made that up. <laughs> Maybe there are. <laughs> but, um, and they're both good and they're both beautiful. Um, but my heart has always been drawn very close to the Russian um, life of what they call a Pustinic. And much of what I learned came from living there and, you know, reading their lives directly, but then also was influenced by Catherine Daugherty. Um, Catherine Dehook Daugherty was her name. And she founded Madonna House up in Combermere, Canada. And she wrote several books and, you know, her roots were Eastern, but she became Roman Catholic. And, you know, by moving to the West, she decided that she wanted to teach the West about this Eastern way of living the spirituality. And it really resonates with me because, um, you know, now that I am not able to, for this time, live, you know, an intense 
hermit life the way that it would look like in the West, my heart has remained very hermit and my heart is able to live it as she describes in her book, Pustinia. And, you know, in the Russian spirituality, there's several words that you'll always find that um, are together. One is Pustinik, or, which is a hermit, um, or a Pustinia, which is um, a hermitage or a desert, right? Um, and a second would be a Stranik, which is a pilgrim, somebody that... Um, arises from their pustinia, from their hermitage, and goes out on a pilgrimage on foot into the world. Um, and she talks a lot about how after you're a hermit for a long time, you're never a hermit for yourself. You're a hermit for the world. And after a time, many, you know, hermits are called to arise and to go out and to give the world the riches that they receive here in this this little cell, you know, with my sweet Jesus, right? <laughs> you know, there's much that he has taught me that I want to share. Um, and that you can keep that pustinia, that heart of a hermit in your heart. Then there's a third world, word that often goes with pustinic, pustinia, stranic, and that is urodivoy. And an urodivoy is a holy fool. And they are um, the souls who are willing to to have other people take them to be almost mentally insane, to be fools for Christ, um, just in reparation for, you know, people calling him a fool. And she argues, and correctly, that when you live a radical life for Jesus Christ, and she always says to live a radical, live the gospel radically without compromise, and I repeat that unendingly because I agree with her. People will call you a fool, right? Um, you know, in today's world, who would give up money and a life of prosperity to spend years tucked away in a little wooden, unair conditioned hut in the woods? A holy fool, right? Somebody who, who wants to withdraw from everything to enter back into that secret place with Jesus. And that would be me. <laughs> um, and I will tell you, it is incredible. Even, you know, when I came last night to kind of prepare things before I came back today to record this. As soon as I open this door and I smell that wooden smell. And, and my hermitage has a particular smell. I don't know if it's like the cleaning supplies or the stain I put on the floor or... Um, what it is, because we keep the windows open in the summer because there's no air conditioning. And it's like a sauna in here. Um, but that smell draws me back. And what does it draw me back to? I get that same feeling as when I'm reading about hermits that lived 1,500 years ago. It's like this little hut can transport me in, like out of time and out of place where I seriously feel the presence of Catherine of Siena and her little cell under the stairs at her parents, or Rose of Lima, who had a little hermitage, just like mine, in the backyard of her parents' house. And she played guitar. I just found that out recently. You know, and gave her life as a lay woman. She wasn't in a religious community. She ended up becoming a third-order Dominican. But, um... Because she was just a simple lay person in love with her husband, Jesus Christ. And so there's many similarities between, you know, what I have felt called to live um, and Rose of Lima. And then one more word that Catherine didn't write about, and I wish she would have, that's very Russian, that goes with Pustinia, Pustinik, you know, Stranik, Urodivoy, is a Staritz. A staritz, starit, a staritz. It's um, an old, wise person. And she talks about when you leave everything and you enter into a life only with God, how he infuses a wisdom. It's the wisdom of the cross, but he infuses a wisdom into you where then other people will come and they'll knock at your little hermitage door. And you were never to keep that door shut. They say, you know, hermits of old never had a lock on their door. Now, 
when I would spend endless nights up here praying all night, I would lock the door in the middle of the night because sometimes I got vandals that would wander around and I didn't want anybody coming in on me. But during the day or actually just with your heart, you never want your heart locked closed. You always want to open to people and let them come. And she says, a staritz is somebody that God is filled with his wisdom from silence and solitude and a life soaked completely in him. And it doesn't matter your age. It's, it's, it means like an older person, but you can be 30 or 35, she said, and full of the wisdom of God if you choose to follow that narrow path. And he fills your heart with that for other people. So we're going to talk about that during this hour. What are those words and why did they so powerfully attract me? And I brought her books and kind of flipping through this morning, I just started shoving holy cards to mark places so I could read different excerpts because she lights my heart on fire. And I used to have her books on CD. I might have a few still. And there were sections that I would just like, when I would drive in the car, listen to over and over and over again until they pounded in my heart. Because I wanted to not only like consider what she said once, but I wanted to become that, right? You know, there's a story about, you know, these old monks somewhere. And I don't remember if they were, they were hermits, if they were Greek or if they were Russian, I don't remember. It's the, you know, the desert fathers, and at one point they were talking about, um, you know, reaching the state of perfection and there was nothing that one of them could do anymore. And the other one said to him, no, there's one thing you haven't done yet that you can be do. You know, you can be transformed completely into fire. Completely. So that you're not just giving a light to someone through your words. Imagine if little light bulbs were coming out of my mouth, right? That's my hope. That as I speak, it brings little light bulbs to your heart. And that you listen and the light goes on. And, and something of God is illumined and attracts you and purified and deepened, right? Well, what if I wasn't just speaking light bulbs to you? What if I was a light bulb? What if I wasn't just a light bulb, but I was a bonfire? You know, when I'm a light bulb, I need to have a cord attached to me and plugged in into his sacred heart, right? And he's the source of light and it comes through the cord into me and out to you. But it's because his heart is a fire, right? Well, what if instead of being a light bulb attached to him, I became one with him. What if I drew so close to Jesus that I caught on fire? And then I burned with that same fire. And what does fire do? It unites us, right? It unites metal and it, and it softens us and it transforms us, right? What if I did that? That's my goal. So that's the life that the Russians really um, taught when they used that word hermit or pilgrim, or holy fool, right? Or like a wise elder. I can't remember now if we have a word like that in, in English, but a starites, right? We know people like that. You know, it's the holy 90-year-old nun hidden away in the hospital room who's full of wisdom. It's, it's the, the, um, the man that I interviewed last week and I put up on my Facebook page. Um, Rumwald Simeon, and he's 94 years old, and he spent his whole life serving the church in the missions. What he was sharing was um, wisdom. The Russians would say mudrost, right? Um, in Polish, it's mądrość. <sighs> A wisdom. And Solomon, when he prayed for wisdom in scripture, wasn't praying for intelligence. The word wisdom that he asked for was a listening heart. When you pray for wisdom, you're praying for a listening heart. Why? Because then your heart is opened and it's listening and God can pour into that heart his wisdom for other people, right? So if, if you embrace a life like I'm describing, you leave the world 
and its comforts. And you withdraw to a physical solitude to make your heart an interior solitude so that you can listen to God, be filled with his wisdom, and then, like a good stranik, a pilgrim, to go out and to share that with the world. Sometimes it's, you know, through writing. We have the writing of the Desert Fathers. They didn't have internet or anything like that. But they shared and left their wisdom. And people would come for miles and knock at that door. And he would open it and offer a, um, bread and a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. And they would always leave with an icon or a cross or something that they made for them. That's why when I was a hermit, and I mean, even still now somewhat, but I would have so many people come to see me. And so I would write to these people in Russia and ask them to send me icons or things that I would always be able to give somebody when they left. And sometimes the shopkeepers would, would write me back and say, I want to donate to your mission. It's beautiful. And they would send me free icons as long as I was giving them out to the people who were seeking spiritual help. So it's a very beautiful ministry. So first from Pustinia, um, you know, she's talk, Catherine is talking about standing still and how important it is to take a time, you know, and, and a hermit does it with all their life, but all of us need to take time every day to stand still, right? And he's talking about that when you stand still, even in the midst of outward noise of daily living and the duties of your state of life, God will use that standing still to bring order to your soul. And he will bring his order, God's order to your soul that will bring tranquility, his tranquility, and it will bring silence of a sort. It will bring the silence of a lover listening with all his being to the heartbeats of his beloved. Sometimes when you take time alone in silence with God, all you hear is that the heartbeat. There's something so beautiful to sit here and to hear the rain on the windows. Today, it's a sprinkler. <laughs> I combined five hoses to go from the house up here because my poor flowers needed a good watering. But do you hear the water? I don't know if it picks it up. But it's so beautiful to just have that sound, right? And in that, you can hear the heartbeat of God. It's the silence of a bride who in utter joy listens to her heart re-echoing every word of her beloved. It's the silence of a mother so deep and inward that in it she listens with her whole being to the voice of her children playing in a nearby yard. Right? Such a silence will come and take possession of the lover, right? And when you do that, it will bring you the peace of Christ. People who do this will move among men gently, softly, kindly. Love will shine in their every gesture, in their every word. There will always be time to do something for someone else, somewhere. For the silence within them will become part of God's loving, mighty, creative, fruitful silence. It won't be silence for the sake of self. It will bear fruit, right? Because it's a silence of God entering in. God's voice will be heard through these people. His face will be seen in their face. The light of it will become a light to their neighbor's feet, right? Like I was saying, to be a light, to be a hermit, to be someone withdrawn and soaked in God is not for yourself. It's for other people. Thus, this kind of silence will bring peace to all people. And this prayer of silence will be heard in our land far and wide. And the beloved once and more will come to dwell among men and the world will be restored to him. How? Through silence. That's why of all the work that I've been drawn into, 
I have to be very careful to never let it infringe on this time in front of the Blessed Sacrament and here beneath the cross in the hermitage, in the silence, withdrawn in the woods. Because it's there that the peace of God comes and can reach and change the whole world. The Pustinia, the hermitage, is the place where we can go in order to gather courage to speak the words of truth. Remembering that truth is God and that we proclaim the word of God. The Pustinia will cleanse us and prepare us to do so like the burning coal that the angel placed on the lips of the prophet. Right? To a Russian, then, the word can mean a quiet, lonely place that people wish to enter to find the God who dwells within them. It can also mean truly isolated places, to which specially called people go as hermits, to seek God in solitude, silence, and prayer for the rest of their lives. So there's people called to do it forever, and then there are people called to just every day take that time, right? And they talk about the difference between a Western hermit and an Eastern Russian pustinic, right? And she says there is some kind of a difference. The pustinic seems to be more available. There was a gracious hospitality about him, as if he were never disturbed by anyone who came to visit him. On the contrary, his was a welcoming face. His eyes seemed to sparkle with joy at receiving a guest. He seemed to be a listening person, a person of few words, but his listening was deep, and there was a feeling that he understood. In him, St. Francis's prayer seemed to become incarnate. He consoled, he understood, he loved, and he didn't demand anything from anyone for himself. In Russia, Pustinics were called Staritz, or Staritsa, for a woman, meaning the old one and the wise one. That's just what we say. Even though they had gone into the Pustinia around the age of 30 or 35, you don't have to be old in age to be a Pustinia, uh, Staritz. And after your study, uh, Pustinic, sometimes you go as a Stranik on a pilgrimage, right? You just depart. You leave the house. You leave the village. Sometimes at night. You leave a message that you've gone on a pilgrimage. And maybe you'll find a hermitage somewhere in which to pray to God for your sins and the sins of the world, to atone, to fast, to live in poverty, and to in enter the great silence of God. That's how people did it. They just got up and they left. You're talking about the Urro Divoy then, those holy fools that take that, that vocation of being everything for Jesus one step further, that take that poverty that you enter into as a pustinic and as a pilgrim and take it one step further to not only give up, you know, physical pleasures of the world, but relationships sometimes, but to give up even other people's respect where they call you mentally insane, right? She says those were a group of people who lived with the poor and were totally poor themselves, begging their alms at church doors and street corners. They fasted. One might say they stood side by side with the Pustiniki, for they too, though living in abject poverty, lived alone and prayed and listened. But their vocation was that of witnessing to the folly of the cross. Right? Because men continue to call God a fool, the Uro Divoy feel that they have a continuous vocation of poverty, atonement, and prayer, like the Pustinic, but different than them. Then there are also the pilgrims, the Straniki, right, that crisscrossed Russia, carrying their Pustinias in their hearts, sleeping under trees and haylofts, wherever they were allowed to, 
They were poor, alms-begging people praying for the whole world constantly. And you know, people oftentimes know that Jesus prayer that came from Russia, right? And these kind of people try to pray continually in their heart, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner, right? Gospody Isusa Christe, Sin Chilovyechiska, Pamilui Minya Grishni. These, you know, hermits, especially the Eastern hermits, were people who craved in their hearts to be alone with God in his immense silence. But you never go into this immense silence of God for yourself. You go and offer yourself as a holocaust or a victim for others. Russians say that if you're called into a pustinic, if you feel that in your heart, you must go there or you'll die because God called you and the call is that great and that strong and that specific, right? But then even when you withdraw and go to the pustinia, you must speak then what God gives you to others. You must repeat God's voice like a prophet, she says. Humanly and psychologically speaking, the Pustinic is reluctant to speak, as every prophet is reluctant. But to him, too, comes the angel with the coal of fire, that invisible angel that cleanses his mind and mouth and lips. When they leave their home and they go into a Pustinia, they go alone into the unknown. You go to be physically, truly alone with God. You empty your mind and your soul of all your relationships because from now on, they would be without all of their loved ones in a new relationship. By leaving people, they go into a deeper dimension of love. I love the entire world more with my time with them here in silence and prayer than if I was serving them. You know, and here on my wall, maybe at the end I'll show you, it's covered with pictures of people from all the missions where I ever was. Because they are truly here in my hermitage with me. And I pray for them. I come here for them. But we relate on a new dimension of love. The Pustineki carry in their hearts all those who they left behind in the great silence of God they would be constantly lifted up to the face of God. And so for this, a pustina has to care and not care, which is true. You have to love people, but in some way you have to be okay with putting them aside if need be, right? From the moment their pustinia was built, from the moment of their closing the door upon themselves, not only they, but all of humanity entered into that cabin, that little shed with them. It was for all of mankind that the Pustinic was to pray, to weep, to endure the temptations that come to him who lives in the desert. It was for them, for you, right? That I was to mortify my flesh. It's for you that I accepted the loneliness that transcends our understanding. And which at the same time, once you accept, is no loneliness at all. God also calls a hermit to go so deep into himself that they are consumed with and radiate his joy, okay? And joy can be an act of the will, right? You decide to rejoice in something difficult. But she says, if you ever see a sad hermit or pustinic, then he's no pustinic at all. Now, I'm not talking about if you see somebody praying in church, looking at a crucifix where they see Jesus bleeding and they're crying. Well, they're just mystically united with Christ. But when they meet and speak with you, they should exude joy, right? In Russia, pustinics have the eyes of a child, even when they're old, for they are filled with the joy of the Lord himself. They have entered the silence of God, which is filled with God's joy. So if you ever see a sad pustinic, 
then he's being a hypocrite. He's not enough with God, right? And I know when I meet people and I'm drained, it means that I have not taken the time I'm supposed to have with God. The life of a Pustinic should be truly joyous with the quiet joy of the Lord, and this will be visible. He will have the eyes of a child, even if his face is of an old woman or an old man. And once somebody becomes in the habit of praying all the time, then they can leave the Pustinia. It says it's, that the Pustinic can leave the Pustinia when he has ceased to know that he is praying. Then it's time to go, like Christ the preacher, to prophesy. That's to say, to tell others that which God has imparted on him in his great silence. Then the Pustinic becomes a Stranik, a pilgrim again. He doesn't usually return to his native place or people, though he might pass among them, right? But they don't usually even listen or respond to texts. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they do, but like, you know, sometimes it's, they say with Jesus, a prophet's never accepted in their own home, right? Um, it's, you know, there's been times I've prepared things and presented them and thought that they would land in Granger and they landed in Pakistan, right? But God has his way with the Holy Spirit. A pilgrim may become a Pustinic and a Pustinic may become a pilgrim. They, they, they interchange, right? And he talks about how you don't pull people into your pustinia. When people wanted to meet with me as a hermit, we met in my parents' kitchen, right? Or at a Martin's Cafe. I always had to have my heart open so that I was willing to sit down and have a conversation with them. If it's important. And she stresses that, right? I, I don't chit-chat about some TV show. But if, you know, somebody has a need, I always have to say yes, but you never pull them into your actual hermitage. And I was very careful, and I still am, that this hermitage, blessed by a bishop, is a cloister, right? And I always had that same spot in my room where people didn't just run up to Aunt Mary's bedroom, right? My parents did not go in there. That was my cloister. And he, she says, you don't pull people into that. That's your space with God. Now, once in a while, I would want people to come up and they could pray in the, in the hermitage and see the crucifix for five minutes when I'm here and I bring them, right? But it's not a public place. It's a place where you're withdrawn, right? And she talks about how we become just like Jesus on the cross when you enter into a pustinia. It's a total purgation, a total self-emptying. In the Gospel of the Passion, we see how Christ is silent before the authorities. Imagine God is silent. He asks for nothing. He gives himself. If you want to see what a contribution really looks like, look at the man on the cross. You know, she talks about a priest that came up to um, Combermere in Canada, and he kept saying, what can I do? And she would say, Father, your presence here is a gift. And he didn't understand that. But she went on to explain that, look at the man on the cross. That is a contribution, right? When you're hanging on a cross, you can't do anything because you're crucified. When your hands are nailed, you can't do a whole lot. But the Pustinic's loneliness itself is of salvific and cosmic proportions. That is your contribution. By hanging on your cross of loneliness, your healing rays, like the rays of the whole sun, can penetrate the whole earth. Just by sitting in loneliness, that can be salvific for the world. No one can tell how far the healing rays from a Pustinic's loneliness, united with God, penetrates into the world. The world is cold and someone must be on fire 
so that people can come and put their cold hands and feet against the fire. If anyone allows this to happen, but especially a hermit, a pustinic, then he will become a fireplace at which men can warm themselves. What a beautiful image. His rays will go out to the ends of the earth. Sometimes in English, we say that if you have zeal, then you have a lot of energy, right? And you're doing a lot for God. But real zeal, Catherine Doherty says, is standing still and letting God be a bonfire in you. It takes more strength to stand still sometimes. It's not very easy to have God's fire in you. Only if you're possessed of true zeal will you be able to contain God's bonfire. We must allow God to contribute to the world through us, which means we must be naked before him and then let him dress us with whatever he wants, right? And they say, she says, you know, eventually people will come to the Pustinic because they get good vibes from them. She, she jokes about that word. That people can feel their spirituality. They say there's something different about you, right? So then she talks more about helping people. If someone asks if he can come to see you in your Pustinia, don't ask why. Simply say, I'd be delighted to be of any help to you that I can, but stress the word help. If such a person comes in and sits down, it might become apparent very soon that he's only come out of curiosity and we don't have time to bear with people's curiosity, right? You're not in a pustinia to satisfy curiosity seekers. If they are simply asking questions like, where do you come from? How long have you been here? I get that on text messaging all the time through Facebook. And that's why I put up that post last week. I can't answer things like that, right? You're supposed to cut them off gently but firmly. And when people start arguing, but I want to talk, that's not fair, then I have to block them, right? Because it's infringing on me actually having time to pray and then help people who need help, right? Try to get these people to pray with you. And I do that through podcasts. This is what I call courtesy of the Pustinia. Pray with such people and let them go, right? It's your duty to make the other person aware that the place you are and the vocation you live is holy. It's not just secular. So your approach in such a situation must be courtesy gentleness and tenderness while using a scalpel. People cannot come to you for a cup of tea and gossip, right? For Russian, a solitary person is a hospice, an inn for every person. So you have to be open to welcome everyone in, but to lead them to God, right? But your hospitality has to be total. It's not enough to share your bread or tea or coffee, although that's kind of nice. But you have to offer more than that. You have to offer hospitality of the heart. The serene acceptance of any and all interruptions by visitors whom you may not even know personally. And to keep a serene and peaceful heart to such people, right? And such peace that's in your heart from Jesus and the Pusenia should radiate to other people. You should see Jesus Christ in each person and be completely indifferent if they're interrupting your prayer, if they need something, right? So to be a Pustinic, you have to be flexible, right? You have to be flexible with the freedom of Christ, unperturbed about himself and what's happening, always adapting easily, not standing on ceremony. And a Pustinic is known by his fruits. One fruit of the Pustinia is a defenselessness that flows from freedom. If someone walks all over him, 
with hobnailed boots, he kisses the person's feet and says, thank you very much for treating me like this. I'm a poor sinner. The Pustinic is like a rubber ball. The worse you treat him, the harder he bounces back. You just can't keep him down. It's a real example of defenselessness and forgiveness. A Pustinic is a living forgiveness. You can't really hurt him. He's tempered like steel, refined seven times like fine silver, and in the Pustinia something happens. He becomes supple through hardness and hard through being supple. I already said that about not keeping your door locked, right? And being tireless. He talks about when you begin to move into the world, you'll be tireless. You'll be tireless as you go on Christ's mission when you rise up from the Pustinia. You'll be tireless as you answer questions, tireless as you travel to all sorts of places. This tirelessness is the gift of the Pustinia. God enticed you there to make you tireless for him. The words you speak become the word. Weakness becomes strength. These things will happen as a result of your constant going to the altar and laying on it everything great and small. That's why a hermit must be a Eucharistic hermit. It's very important to have that time with Jesus. Mass needs to be your anchor of time, needs to be your clock. You live from mass to mass. You bring him everything you've lived and lay it on the altar. And then you go and you live those graces until the next mass. You must bring everything to him in the Eucharist. That's why my heart was so divided as a hermit. In Texas, I had the Blessed Sacrament. Here, I couldn't. And so I never knew what was more important to keep a true eremitical solitude in this little oratory or to have the Eucharistic presence in church where I could be bothered. You want to have your heart open to other people, like she said, but you also don't want to enter into a very busy place on purpose because then you're not being a hermit, right? If they come and they find you, it's different. So you need to have solitude and you need to have the Eucharist. And so that's why, you know, the places I lived where I could have the Eucharist and a chapel, oh, that was, that was a true aeromedical vocation. Those who provided that understood the aeromedical life, right? One day, by God's grace, after you bring him everything big and small, you will lie upon the altar yourself. Instead of bringing him things, you become part of that altar with Christ. Or the sacrifice, the victim, the holocaust on that altar with him. You're supposed to empty yourself as Christ emptied himself. The hands of a hermit are always to be empty. He uses things for his health, his needs to be able to help others, but nothing sticks to his fingers. I mean to the fingers of his mind and heart, right? You don't, you know, write, grab things for yourself. She talks about when she, um, the gift of tears that can come to a hermit. And when she started her mission in Harlem, she says, you know, I used to lie on the floor at night and cry myself to sleep. What was the use of lying down in a bed with broken springs that jabbed you painfully when all the sadness and pain in the world was pouring into your soul? Better to lie on the floor and cry and cry until there were no tears left. Only now do I realize why I cried on that funny floor in Harlem. I cried because I had been taught long ago and far away in Russia that tears wash away the sin of the world. It just never occurred to me at the time that was what I was doing. It never occurred to me that God had given me the gift of tears. No 
no doubt I cried for myself too. And for those who were persecuting me. That's the Russian way. You cry for yourself, you cry for those who hurt you, and you cry for the world. She talks about the suffering she had in her life, the persecution, the loneliness, the pain, and the rejection. But how God allowed them to use that to unite her to himself. She saw in her hermitage how all the times of her life where she felt alone, it was a time of hermitage. And it's beautiful to hear her reflect on it because you too, in your homes, you know, the stay-at-home mom during the day, turn off the TV. And you might like wish your husband had more time to talk to you and you're really lonely and your friends won't answer and your sister's really busy. And what do you do, right? All you've got are little two-year-olds chirping at you. That loneliness is a pustinia, a hermitage where you can find union with Jesus. And if you cry because you're having a bad day or you spilt dinner, offer that up to cry for the world, right? And she says at the end, God is extending the same invitation to you as he extended to me. To you also, he says, I'm lonely. That's what you were, weren't you? Didn't you really start out on your pilgrimage because you were lonely? Now he invites you too to enter Gethsemane, to sweat out your struggle with him. He invites you to stand with him before the high priest that is to say, before all those who will in some way or other laugh at you, jeer at you, persecute you. It's happened. When all this takes place, he'll invite you to come with him to Pontius Pilate and to terrible solitude where you're lied about and misjudged and abused. Into a strange land that man must enter before he dies, that pre-death land the last pilgrimage where strangers will examine you, not understand you, make things up. It might be in Africa, Latin America, some atheistic country, who knows? Finally, God will take you by the hand and lead you to Golgotha to be crucified on the other side of his cross. If you follow him all the way into this Pustinia, which I'm almost afraid to say these words, he has brought me to the West to reveal to you. He will bring you to Golgotha so as to give you the complete, infinite, incredible joy of his resurrection. You have to die with him to be raised with him. This joy will be your guide into the new land where there is no solitude, no silence, no strangeness. It will be the final pilgrimage of love towards love. The crucifixion you will undergo with Alleluia because now you will know what it's all about. This joy is not only for the hereafter. It'll be yours now, dearly beloved. This very minute, tomorrow, the day after, as soon as you accept solitude, silence, strange lands, and pilgrimages with Christ. When you accept such things, you've accepted loneliness, which is none other than the loneliness of Christ. And through that, he will have a rich harvest for the church. Just a few short little snippets here from her book on um, Stranik, on the pilgrim that rises from the hermitage and goes out, right? There's a part of the pilgrimage God may call you to in life. And the pilgrim must love those who hate him and be good to those who are not good to him. He must even come to the point of giving away his clothing and belongings. Then finally he is to enter the pilgrimage of fire, right? So you come into a desert, not to be in a desert, but so that God can create that in your heart to fill it. And you go on a pilgrimage, not to just go on a pilgrimage, but to teach you how to live the pilgrimage of life, right? There's a pilgrimage of fire. Ever since Christ came, 
It's a pilgrimage of passionate, incredible love that would give itself to be a path for Christ to walk on. Such a person is willing to lay down their life for another, to make a red carpet for Christ to walk on through your own suffering and blood. He made a red carpet for us to walk on to the Father. His precious blood was spilled across the world. It was spilled abundantly. We too can spill our blood out of love for Jesus and our neighbor drop by drop. It might not be as abundant as his, but it will be a road sign for other pilgrims to follow, right? Once you've learned to do this, you're to go preach the gospel with your life, not just with your words, person to person, to anyone at any time. There's no rush. The person who comes from the void of God is never rushed, for he bears within himself not only the image of God, but the seal of God's peace that surpasses all understanding. You're called to enter into the way of the cross, which was the pilgrimage that Christ went on to win for us to heaven, right? He said, you have to pick up your cross and follow me, right? Listen to the cries of Jesus the Son as he was flagellated and crucified. Here is a sea of pain, the likes of which we cannot imagine, unless we too are scourged and crucified. Still bloody from the wounds inflicted by his crucifixion, Christ hands us a key of reconciliation. Reconciliation between God and man. He did it all for us. The pilgrimage I'm talking about is for those called to follow step by step the footprints of Christ. These pilgrims are not easily seen because they leave bloody footprints along the way. Oh, they are easily seen because they leave bloody footprints along the way. They're easily seen because there is a light coming from their footprints. When you bleed in life symbolically, right? And you offer it in union with his suffering on the cross. He places his light in that and leaves it for other people. It's a pilgrimage whose only goal is the heart of God. That should be our only goal in life, right? She talks about in her life how she just kept putting one foot in front of the other because she knew that she was called to preach the gospel to people who didn't want to hear it. It was a strange pilgrimage to have to go and preach to people who don't want to hear it. But God kept saying to Catherine, come on higher, come on higher. And she thought she was going to an even colder place than she was before, but it wasn't. It turned out to be a desert. And in this desert, there were strange figures that kept stoning her, but she survived. It's all symbolic, but people act like that sometimes, right? She found herself walking through the desert of life with bare feet. And she knew that the soles of her feet were bloody from suffering with him. Here's a great hermit. That's the card that I have marking one of these pages. Charles de Foucault. I think I've talked about him before, but I love him. Right? He was a hermit. He was in Morocco. So she says, my feet were bloody because I was still pilgrimaging. She understood why her feet were bloody. It was because she was going into the depths of men's hearts. The depths of men's hearts are stony and they wound your feet. You walk on sharp gravel. You try to hold on to something, but there's nothing to hold on to. Going into men's hearts... It's a precipitous descent because men's hearts are deep. And suddenly she realized there was something much more profound in this pilgrimage than just her bloody feet. 
It was taking upon herself the pain of men. It was carrying another person's cross. Crosses have a way of biting into your shoulders and into your back. And, you know, she talks about somewhere else, I didn't mark it, how when you enter a hermitage and then like you're going out on a pilgrimage, you have to, um, you know, become like those you serve. I've spoken about that as a missionary. So she says, you know, the black man suffering, you know, at that time she was fighting for, you know, racial justice and stuff. And she would go into these neighborhoods and, you know, she would feel their pain and weep. You know, the single mom who doesn't have bread for their baby. You have to feel other people's pain with them. That's compassion, right? I have up there an icon. You can't see it, I think, in the camera. A beautiful one of Our Lady of Sorrows. She felt every pain of Jesus in her heart. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to break our hearts from ourselves so there's no more Mary. Conform us to himself. So not only I, but Jesus lives in me. And through that, then share other people's suffering because he suffers all that with them, right? And she says, such a pilgrimage can only be undertaken by love and not human ordinary love. Human love doesn't want precipitous descents into men's hearts. It doesn't want bloody feet. It doesn't want to carry other people's crosses. Who do you know that says, oh, I want to go carry your cross? I know mine's really light. No, everybody usually feels crushed by their own cross. We humans don't want that, but God does. And we who are in love with God can't help ourselves when we have to embark on this pilgrimage because God has given us fantastic gifts, though we do not understand them completely. So at this point, we're able to say, it makes me happy to suffer for you. St. Paul said that. St. Paul says, I am suffering now, and in my own body, I make up what is lacking in the suffering of Christ, right? And not only are we traveling a path, but we're creating a path, right? We're leaving those bloody footprints of light that other people can follow us. It's like creating a a path, taking, you know, having to go and to cut through the weeds and woods, right? To find whoever's lost there and show them a path out to God. The pilgrim becomes a path himself through which the fire of God travels and ignites the hearts of other men. You're all people, but especially a hermit, is called to a pilgrimage that goes outward barefoot to worship the face of Christ someplace. Once in a while, the pilgrim is called to stand still. And it's not easy to stand still. Stillness is beautiful and silence is delectable, but they require a tremendous amount of patience and a faith in God that is almost unshakable. You have to constantly pray, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It's hard to explain what happens between a human heart and God, right? When you're called to stand still. Because the same God that said, arise, come, take up your cross and follow me, suddenly turns around and says, stand still, completely still. As I stood before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate, before the Roman soldiers, and even through my scourging, and know that there will come a day when you will learn the goal of this pilgrimage that I asked you to undertake. Yes, you will stand in perfect stillness because your hands and feet are nailed. You will be crucified still, even as you travel through the world. You will be unable to walk. That's a pilgrimage too, the pilgrimage of Calvary. In fact, it's a supreme pilgrimage, the crown of all pilgrimages. God requests the pilgrim to stand still but not for the sake of silence alone or for solitude. It's so that people may come to him. God asks him to stand still in the middle of the road. Christ stood still at the, you know, and at the foot of the cross, people came to him to drink his, his blood, 
to look at his wounds and to be healed. People who approach him will know immediately that he's a pilgrim because his hands are empty, his feet are bare, because he speaks with peace, right? But there's always something more, something that may not be seen by men's eyes. It's that the pilgrim lives by the Eucharist and drinks the living waters of Christ. His face reflects the pilgrim icon of Christ. He is in love with God. And he can always answer people because you don't ask a pilgrim questions about anything but God. And because there are questions about God, he has the grace to answer them. The pilgrim is wide open. People can look behind him, in front of him, on his side, and there's little to see. There's a crust of bread and a gourd of water, and that's all. So people begin to believe that maybe he can answer their questions. Above all, they begin to experience that they are not as lonely as they were before. Though pilgrims are lonely people, walking alone most of the time, they can create an atmosphere among people of joy and friendship and understanding. The pilgrim doesn't do it by himself. He has discovered how to allow God to do everything. And that's how he preaches without compromise. The last little snippet I want to read before we're finished has to do with Urro Divoy, right? Holy fools. And he ta she talks about how Christ himself exhibited a greater holy foolishness than even St. Francis, who they accused of that, Right? St. Francis said, the Lord told me to be a fool and simpleton, the likes of which has never been seen. But why? Because Christ was that. Can you imagine anything more foolish than voluntarily dying on a cross? So an adult person with a childlike heart can become a fool for Christ. It's not easy to make out of foolishness a lantern to light our path and that of our neighbor. But if we love God, his voice is heard in our hearts. And he's calling us to do the impossible that he makes possible. It's necessary that all of us who are intellectuals have the heart of a child. That each of us experiences ourselves as a child, trusting and loving. He who is a fool for Christ's sake is actually being intelligent. Sometimes God asks us to live or do something that's starkly stupid. It looks like stupidity, not only to others, but to ourselves. We feel very foolish. Except, especially when the situation continues day after day. We have to depend entirely on God who says, without me, you can do nothing. After a while, if we let go and trust him, an incredible freedom comes. We're asked to expect everything from God, to live in a dimension where miracles are going to take place on a faith level, so that the absurdity of the gospel really becomes part of us. I don't mean that we should go and do stupid things just because they're stupid and think that it all makes us Christian. But we must really have in our hearts the foolishness of the cross, the foolishness of being faithful to God. And when you're faithful to God and people call you a fool or call you insane or, you know, mock you, that's a gift. You're being an urro divoy, right? I'm in love with God, Catherine says, but being in love with God is not enough. One has to become a fool for his sake. That means one really needs to listen and do what he says, which few people want to do. She says, I seem to be crying alone in a wilderness. How often we feel like that. Our world is such a wilderness, isn't it?
In order to speak the way God wants you to, you must be crucified on the other side of his cross. Then you'll speak, although you won't say much. Two crucified people don't speak easily, but what they say remains in the hearts of men. Your voice seems to you to be small, unheard, uninspiring. You know nothing of what God has wrought in you. You share Christ's pain. The cross is heavy. But God has chosen you to preach, even though the cross crushes you into the dust of the road. Open your mouth and speak, even if the ascent to Golgotha, which is part of the mountain of the Lord, is hard on you. If you fall down and hit your face against stones, don't stop. Speak the words God gives you. Call them. Implore them. As you lie there flat and bruised, call people to love. To love God so that they might have peace, joy, love, and hope. And so that all may stand, lean, or lie under the shadow of the tree of faith. Open your mouth and speak. Strength will come to you from somewhere. You will be a prophetess. St. Basil the Blessed, I actually have a picture of him in my hermitage. Because <laughs> I told you I love those Russians. St. Basil the Blessed. Yes, he's naked. If you see him, he would wander around. Saint P I want to say Moscow, but St. Petersburg. Naked, right? And he was so holy, people would come to him. And I'm going to read you about him. That's St. Basil the Blessed is his name. So we ask Basil the Blessed to pray for us, right? Smile! <laughs> That's what I'm supposed to look like, except I always said to Jesus, I'm not walking around naked, right? Let me tell you about Basil the Blessed. Oopsie. It's the last thing. The commentary in the, uh, and one of the can, um, calendars that she had with his image, right, on his feast day, said, Holy fools live out the folly of the cross literally and are indifferent to human respect and judgments. They freely embrace an exterior form of folly and eccentricity, abandoning normal prudence and foresight. From early Christian times, the charism of the folly of Christ was recognized and placed side by side with the folly of the martyrs who renounced the supreme value of life to bear witness that Christ is the only one worth living for. St. John the Baptist was called a fool for Christ too. A prime characteristic of the fools for Christ is their extreme freedom, which allows them to reproach and correct in a fraternal way even rich and powerful people, starting from that one foundation, which is the love of Christ. Basil the Blessed, a holy fool, canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church. Oh, lived in Moscow. It was in Moscow. I was right with my gut. Without a roof over his head, and he spent many of his nights in prayer on the porches of churches. But he was naked. He was very beloved. In an early biography, it is related that whether in summer or winter, he wore neither clothes nor footwear, like primitive man in the early paradise before sin entered the world. Holy foolishness like this is a genuine calling from God, and the fool can reach people where other forms of holiness, such as a good teaching, cannot. You know, sometimes you can explain the truth of something to someone over and over and over again, and they don't get it. And then they meet somebody who lives radically, and their jaw drops open, and they say, I want that. It's, it's the charism of their life that reaches people. Holy fools are often playful and joking, but always for the spiritual benefit of others. The idea of the medieval fool or court jester could tell a king bitter truths about himself, which would be unacceptable from other people. Fools for Christ frequently manifest the gift of prophecy, and some people are converted through the fulfilled prophecies. 
Holy fools are also distinguished by an interior freedom, partly won by an acquired imperviousness to physical suffering and hardship. Their aestheticism includes abstinence from food and sleep and the indifference to the elements, whether they're hot and cold. Some holy fools in Russia walked half naked in all climatic conditions, had no roof over their heads, even when winters were severe. They imitated the humiliation and kenosis of self-emptying of Jesus Christ. Holy fools imitate the divine fool. They also imitate Christ in his compassion for sinners. Holy fools often associate with the poor and outcasts and become one with them, for they are an icon of Christ. They remain a stranger in the place where they live and their personality remains unknown or hidden. Fools for Christ are especially popular in Russian spirituality, but the Greek Orthodox Church has canonized holy fools. The most notable, St. Simon of Emesia, Emesa? who lived in the 6th century and St. Andrew in the 9th. Readers of Tolstoy may recall his description of God's fool, Grisha. Among Roman Catholics from whom Catherine considered holy fools for Christ are St. Francis of Assisi and his brother Juniper, St. Joseph Labre, Dorothy Day, Peter Marin. It kind of comes from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, where he writes, Christ sent me to preach the gospel not by means of wisdom, of language, wise words, which would make the cross of Christ pointless. The message of the cross is folly for those who are on the way to ruin, but for those of us who are on the road to salvation, it's the power of God. As scripture says, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of any who understands. Where are the philosophers? Where are the experts? In today's word, we'll say, where are the psychologists, right? Do you not see how God has shown up human wisdom as folly? Since in the wisdom of God, the world was unable to recognize God through wisdom. It was God's pleasure to save believers through the folly of the gospel. While the Jews demand miracles and Greeks look for wisdom, we are preaching a crucified Christ to the Jews an obstacle that they cannot get over and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who have been called, whether they are Jews or Greeks, a Christ who is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's folly is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Anyone who thinks he is wise by worldly standards must learn to be a fool in order to be truly wise. Oh, sweet Jesus, we praise and adore and glorify you for this time together. We ask you to touch all souls on earth, to create within their hearts a pustinia so they could be pustiniki, hermits in their heart, that they take time every day to enter into that with you. We ask you to make us all holy straniki, pilgrims that are journeying on your kresni puti, on your way of the cross, through those bloody footsteps all the way to heaven. We ask you to make us staritsi, wise people, soaked in your love through Eucharistic adoration, through prayer of the rosary of silence and solitude, possessed by the Holy Spirit, so that we may give food of wisdom to those who come to call at our hearts. We ask you for the grace and the courage to even ask to be an Uro Divoy. We ask you to make us courageous when people call us fools, to remain faithful no matter what is said or done. We ask you to make us humble enough, like an animal, the little ones, 
that as soon as people persecute us, it washes right off of us. Keep us as adults with children's hearts. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia. Thank you.